Today, we want to talk about myths and legends of the North. Now, most Westerners, that is, North Americans, which most of you are, or even, even Western Europeans now, do not get, um, do not have much of a recollection of the things related to Norse mythology, the Norse gods, which is actually very strange because most of our days of the week are named after Norse god. Did you know that? Tuesday is named after the god Tyr. It's Tyr's day. Wednesday is actually Woden's day. Thursday is Thor's day. Friday is Frigg's day or Freya's day because those two goddesses were sort of interchangeable. And the others, you know, uh, are related to celestial bodies which were personified. In fact, Thor is uh, the, the natural elements, the sun, the moon, the earth are all personified. Thor was the child of Odin and Jord, which is another name for Earth. So it, it gets very complicated. Only Hindu mythology is more complicated than Norse mythology, I think, because they have, you know, women giving birth to elephants and things like that, so, which we don't want to think about. Um, if you're a big fan of Marvel movies or comics or whatever, then you probably know that Thor is the god of thunder. If you're really a big fan, you might know that his great hammer is called Mjolnir. Did you know that? Mjolnir? Okay. If you've watched the movies, they talk about that. But the interesting thing is, we typically in the West have a much greater understanding of Greek mythology and of Roman mythology than we do of Norse mythology, even though the Vikings that were the ones who really yeah, propagated the Norse mythology were much closer to us, both geographically and, and in time. They're more recent. And our culture has been much more affected by them, not just the days of the name, the uh, names of the days of the week, but also various other influences on our language, and even in some ways, probably in our sort of ethos and the way we think about things. We have been significantly influenced by the Viking way of thinking, which comes out of their mythology, and so there's much for us to to learn from that. I think. Um, I had another slide in there, so sorry, you're looking at Emir. He's ugly. But um, the, all of this mythology is Northern Germanic. Prior to the coming of Christianity, this was the pagan religion of the North countries. After the coming of Christianity, it didn't go away, but it took on the tone of folklore rather than religion. The Norse mythology are tales about gods, about the interaction between gods and various human heroes and other beings, including giants and elves and um, ice giants, fire giants, all sorts of beings. Even after this lost the influence of being a religious belief and was only in the nature of folklore, there's been a lot of fascination uh, with it. In the Romantic period especially, I mean, you know about Wagner coming along and writing all of his Norse mythological um, operas. Ring of the Nibelung and the others. That's why, unfortunately, we end up with fat ladies singing with horn helmets on. Um, and that's because the Wagner, and that was a revival that came out of the Romantic period. And then in modern times, there's been um, a, a significant revival of interest, especially because there is a neo-paganist movement that's going on right now. In fact, in Iceland, they're just getting ready, they're actually behind schedule, to open the first temple to the Norse gods in over a thousand years. And they're very serious about this. Um, they're in, in parts of Britain, in parts of Scandinavia, and most especially in Iceland, there is a rebirth of the idea of uh, believing in the Norse gods. Now, most of them will say they don't actually believe in the Norse gods, but they believe in the values they think those gods represent. But still, you know, they are worshiping in the name of Thor and Odin and Freya and others. So, kind of interesting. All of these stories originally were written in Old Norse, which is a Northern Germanic language. Now, most of the languages, uh, Germanic languages, Old German led to Old Norse in Scandinavia, and there's Icelandic is a version of that. But it also led to originally Old English. English is a Germanic language, but it's been influenced by Norse, which had become a different language, and also by French, as we talked about. But the the issue of the language is very important. In fact, uh, are you any of you J.R.R. Tolkien fans, Lord of the Rings, and all of that? Hugely influenced by these stories. Um, in fact, the in the Hobbit, all of the 
all of the dwarfs, you know, Bofor, Bambor, Feely, Keely, all, all those names are directly taken out of Norse mythology. Middle Earth, which is the, the place where the hobbits live in J.R.R. Tolkien, is Midgard. That's what Midgard, the land where humans live in Norse mythology, is it, it means Middle Earth. So there's all these different references. All of them go back to the primary sources for those are Icelandic. There was a poetic Edda, it was called, which was ancient stories, and ancient in this case means 6th, 7th, 8th century, that got compiled in the 13th century in Iceland. Iceland is really the focal point of a lot of this. In that same century, the 13th century, a guy named Snorri Sturluson. You need to remember the name Snorri Sturluson. Or, I'm sorry, Snorri Sturluson. I got it wrong. Snorri Sturluson. Not only because he's significantly responsible for a lot of the legends that came down to us, but if you ever do any reading about geothermal technology, which they're doing a huge amount with in Iceland right now, he was the first person they could identify who actually used geothermal technology. He heated his swimming pool with it in the 13th century. And he's the one that compiled a lot of these legends in what's called the Prose Edda. There are also thousands, in addition to the Poetic Edda and the Prose Edda, Edda of Snorri Sturluson, there are also thousands of sagas, old stories and tales about the old heroes. Some of them come from what's called the Migration Age, which is when all of the, the barbarian tribes were going back and forth across Europe, and they have characters in them from history, like Attila the Hun is featured in some of these. And uh, so they're, they're fascinating how these things actually do link to history. One of the characteristics that you run into, which is, uh, I think, very interesting, is uh, something called euhemerization. Euhemerization. Can you all spell that? Mm -hmm. It's E-U, never mind. E euhemerization is the process of taking human beings and turning them into deities over a long period of time. And this happened in some of the Eddas. It also happened in, in some of the other uh, ancient writings in, in other places. For instance, the Eddas suggest that maybe the great warriors from Troy, the city of Troy, when Troy fell, they moved from Troy into Scandinavia, and in the process, they were so advanced in their abilities and their technology that they became gods, and that that was the source of some of the Norse gods. So that's the process of euhemerization. But let's talk about now the cosmogony of Norse mythology. Cosmogony, the word means the origin of the cosmos. How did the world come into being? It's interesting that all that most of the pluralistic uh, religions in the world, most of the polytheisms in the world, start out their, their histories of creation with how did the gods get created. The monotheistic religions, Christian, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, assume the existence of, of one god who then creates everything else from nothing. But almost all the other polytheistic religions, they start out trying to explain where the gods themselves came from. And in the case of Norse mythology, they have a very colorful um, story. It's very subtle in its meaning. There's a lot of ethos that we can take out of it. And that story is that before there was any soil or sky or anything green growing, there was a, an abyss of darkness and silence called Genungagar. Genungagar. Sometimes it's Genungagap. So I'll use Ganunga Gap. Ganunga Gap was this at, uh, abyss in between the two extremes. There was a kingdom called Muspelheim, or an area called Muspelheim, which was the place of elemental fire. And there was the place called Niflheim, which was the place of elemental ice. One was heat, one was ice. Slowly, the, the fire from Mus Muspelheim and the ice from Niflheim started coming toward one another across the abyss of um, Ganungagap. And in Ganungagap, when the fire and the ice came together and it started melting and it started creating this water, out of the drops of water from the melted ice came Ymir. This is not the most flattering photograph we have of Ymir, um, nor is that. He was the first of the great ice giants, and he came because of the melted ice when heat and ice came together. Ymir was a hermaphroditic, which means he did not require another creature to reproduce. And so as he sweated from the heat from Muspelheim, he generated other giants. And so other giants were born from that. 
also we have sort of just appearing um, a cow, a cow called uh, Alhumla. Alhumla nourished Emir with her milk. That's what you have going on right here. And she then nourished herself by licking the salty ice blocks. So Emir gives birth to the other gods. He is nourished by the cow Aldombla. And eventually, as, um, as you have here, uh, there you go, um, Aldombla licking the ice uncovers another being who's named Buri. He is the first of the tribe of gods, the ice ear. And Buri has a son named Bor, who marries one of the giants that has been produced by Emir. They have three sons, Odin, remember Odin, Vili, and V, his two brothers. Odin, Vili, and V then turn on Emir and kill him. They tear him apart. And when they tear him apart, they use the parts of him to create the world of humans, Midgard. They also kill almost all the other giants, but they're not successful in killing them all. And once they have created the world, then two beings come from the remains of Emir. They're two human beings called Ask and Embla, represented up here. And we also, Odin, who is the stronger of the three brothers and ends up being the, the king of the gods, he's traveling around and he finds in the land of the giants these two beautiful beings that they, they're, one is, they're both beings of brightness, and they're a brother and sister, a male and female, and they are called Saul and Manny. And they were named after the sun and the moon. So Odin gives them the responsibility, he gives them chariots. And Saul is responsible to drive the chariot that carries the sun across the sky every day. And Manny is responsible for carrying the chariot that, that carries the moon across the sky every night. Just to make sure that they don't slough off on their job, he also creates two giant wolves named Hattie and Skoll. And Hattie and Skoll chase Saul and Manny across the sky every day and every night. If they catch them, they will devour them. And that's how Odin makes sure that the sun always is consistent in traveling across the sky and the moon traveling across the sky at night. So they've got all these explanations for where these things came from. There are three other beings that are called Norns. The Norns are the, the ones who hold, maintain destiny for all of the created world. The three Norns, one is called Erd. Erd is the, the Norn responsible for what once was. I often wonder if Charles Dickens got his, um, his Christmas idea about this. Um, uh, Erd was the, the Norn of what once was. Verdandi is the second Norn, who is the Norn of what is coming into being and schooled is the norn of what shall be, you know, Christmas past, Christmas present, Christmas future. Well, they cover the three aspects of human destiny, and it's believed that they, they're they weavers, and they weave our lives together, and at any time, one of them has shears ready to cut our lives off if they choose to, and everything is under their control, all right? Now, all of this, the destruction of Emir in order to create the world, the idea that, that something must die in order for something else to live. There's very important meaning in this in the Norse uh, mindset, in the Norse way of thinking about things, and that is that life comes from chaos, that life in effect comes from death. And so something has to die for something else to live. Whenever the, the believers in Norse mythology, whenever they ate something, something else died so that they could live. When they cleared land for a settlement, the trees died so that they could, could build and, and start a community and families. When they engaged in combat, some one had to die so the other could live. So this idea, the first major idea that really is manifested in Norse mythology is that something, you know, that life comes from death, that order comes from chaos. And then a second aspect, which is very important, and that really significantly causes this to differ from a lot of other kind of ethos or mythologies, is the idea that it's all cyclical. It all goes in cycles. And when we talk about the end of the world, Ragnarok, as they called it, you'll, you'll get a sense of that because everything come back, comes back around again. The monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, have a sense that it began at one point, and it will progress, and then it will end at one point, at least history as we know it. The idea in Norse mythology is that everything is a cycle. Now, along in the creation, there is the great tree of life, which is called Yggdrasil, 
YGG, D-R-A-S-I, uh, I-L. And it's often symbolized in things like this. Yggdrasil is the life tree, the cosmic tree, and the various realms of existence exist in the branches of Yggdrasil. Um, there are nine worlds that exist there, and I'll talk about those in just a second. And the great tree of life, the cosmic tree Yggdrasil, has three roots. One of the roots reach into the land of Asgard, which is from the very highest level. That's where the Aesir gods live, Odin and Thor and uh, Freya and or Frigg, rather, and the others. The, uh, the second root goes down into Midgard, which is where humans live in the middle. And the third root goes down to Niflheim, which is the, um, or I'm, I'm sorry, Helheim, which is their afterlife for those who die a disreputable death. Now, there, within Yggdrasil, they have other symbols. There is a great eagle that sits up in the leaves, uh, in the top of the tree, and when that eagle flaps its wings, we feel the wind in Midgard, in the, the world where we live. They have the great serpent that lives at the base of the tree called Nidhog uh, Nidhogger. Nidhogger gnaws at the roots of the tree, along with many other kinds of serpents. There are deer and goats that are always trying to eat the tree, and they're always trying to damage it. And the Norns, who live at the base of the tree and control our destiny, they take care of the tree and they water it, because that's part of destiny, is making sure that the tree that all life comes from is maintained. And when they water the tree, the, the water that drips off the tree becomes the dew on our world, Midgard. My favorite character in all this is a squirrel. His name is Ratatastir. Ratatastir, his favorite thing to do is he runs back and forth up the tree between the eagle and the serpent and various other beings, um, creating problems by carrying insults. <laughs> oh, you ought to hear what the serpent Nid Nidhogger said about you. Oh, that eagle's been bad-mouthing you again. And so, all this conflict that exists is partly because of the squirrel who's running back and forth, convincing people they should be upset, or convincing creatures they should be upset about things. There are nine worlds in this hierarchy. They are Asgard, Alfheim, Vanaheim, that's not Anaheim, it's Vanaheim, <laughs> um, Jotunheim, Midgard, Muspelheim, Niflheim, Schwartelheim, sometimes called a Nidaveller, in case anybody wondered about that, and Helheim. Now, at the highest level, Asgard is where the, the main group of, of deities live, the main gods. They are the Aesir. Again, that's Odin and Thor and the ones that you've heard of. But there is a second world, which is Vanaheim, where the second tribe of deities live. They're called the Vanir. And so we have two tribes of deities, and I'll, I'll talk about a war between those two in a minute. Alfheim is where the elves live. Jotunheim, a, a Jotun is a giant. That's where the giants live. Midgard, Middle Earth, is where humans live. Muspelheim is the land of fire. Remember, it's the, the there are fire giants there. One of them, Surt, later at the end of the world is very important. Niflheim is the place of, um, of freezing. That's where the ice came from in creation. And then Svartalheim is where the dwarves live. And they are they often live under the earth, and they are the great makers of things. Remember J.R.R. Tolkien, the dwarves are the ones that that make weapons and they, they make uh, jewelry and all kinds of things. And then Helheim is the, the underworld, the place of the dead, where any, any who die a disreputable death go there. I mentioned to you when we talk about Vikings, the Vikings wanted to make sure they always had their weapon in their hand if they died, because if they had their weapon in their hand, then they were dying a reputable death, an honorable death, and they would go to Valhalla, which is the Hall of Odin, and they would live there forever, fighting and drinking and womanizing and feasting, and then if they got killed in a fight, they'd be reborn tomorrow. Well, if they didn't die with their weapon in their hand, they would be condemned to Helheim, which is the place of disreputable death. And there's not like burning fires and everything there, it's just like nothing, everything is just dead. And nobody wanted to go there, and so that's why they were so, it was so important that they always were able to have their weapons in their hand. And Helheim is actually uh, controlled, or the, the goddess that's over Helheim is called Hel. It's H-E-L. And H-E-L, Hel, the expression, go to Hell, excuse me, originally that was a Norse expression. It's go to H-E-L, 
and it meant may you die a disreputable death and have to live with the goddess hell forever. That's where that expression comes from. It's way pre-Christian, so it's before the, the modern concept of heaven and hell kinds of things have been created. So go to hell is an expression you can use without a profanity because you're referring to a, 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 a goddess in the mythology. Okay? So, I'll give you a few minutes to memorize this. Yeah. This is sort of a cartoon example of some of the uh, tribes and beings in the Norse family tree. Up here you've got Emir, remember he was the first of the ice giants. You've got Aldumla, the cow. You've got Buri, who got uncovered by Odumla. And then you've got uh, um, his son, who, entered, who married Bestia, a giant, and one of their children was Odin. And the other two brothers that ended up killing Emir. Um, Odin and Jord, which is the uh, personified Earth, have the son Thor. You've got the giant um, wolf, Fenrir wolf. You've got uh, German Gander, who is the giant serpent. You've got an eight-legged horse named uh, Sleipnir, that's Odin's horse. And um, all these fascinating kinds of stories. Now, you, you also have, in addition to this line over here, you've got a number of other deities. Again, there's the Aesir, which is led by Odin, and the Vanir. At one point, the Vanir and the Aesir got along fine, but one of the Vanir, they, they practiced magic called uh, Cider. And one of them, Freyr, a beautiful woman, she represents love and, and desire and beauty and magic. She goes to, uh, to Asgard, where the Aesir live, and she starts practicing her magic. Well, the Aesir were so proud of the fact that they lived honorable lives, that you know they cared about their families and they were very respectful and they did all the right things. Well, all of a sudden, this magic that um, Freyr brought to Asgard, her magic had to do with controlling destiny. She could predict your destiny, and then by using her magic, she could change your destiny. People started getting so involved in that as a power issue, they stopped paying attention to the moral values. And as a result of that, they finally rebelled against Freyr, and they tried to kill her three times. But she kept being coming back from the ashes, and it led to a war between the Aesir and the Vanir. With the Vanir using magic and the Aesir using uh, conventional weapons, if you will, although it involves magic hammers in case of Thor and things like that. And so they fought this war, and they finally, neither side could win, and they finally come to peace, and they take hostages from one another to guarantee peace, and it goes on from there. But there are these stories about these two tribes interacting with one another. In this chart, there are elves and dwarves, there's monsters, there's magical animals and objects. Um, extraordinary detail in terms of their stories. This is a somewhat simplified version that just deals with Emer, who bred the giants, Odin, who comes from um, giants, and Guri and Bor, who came from the cow Aldumla. Odin and Earth gave birth to Thor. Uh, Loki is not a god, technically. He is a giant. If you've watched the Marvel movies, one of, one of the subplots is that he finds out he's not really the son of Odin, that he actually is the product of ice giants, and he didn't know that. Well, that's not quite accurate because in the Norse mythology, Loki is sort of inveigles his way into becoming a blood brother with Odin, so he's not thought of as the brother of Thor. But he gives birth to several creatures, Fenrir the wolf, German Gander, the uh, Midgard serpent, slight near the eight-legged horse, and he also is the father of Hel, the goddess, even though he himself is a giant. Um, so he gave birth to a giant serpent, a giant wolf, a eight-legged horse, and the the woman who controls the you know the underworld. Um, in fact, the story of him giving birth to Sleipnir, they had a bet with this other deity that he could not accomplish this huge building task, and they promised him great riches if he could do that. They didn't think he had a chance, and so he fa they found out later he has this powerful stallion of a horse that's able to work so hard that he's actually about to win the bet. And the gods of Aesir are really worried about this, and so they convince Loki. Loki is a shapeshifter. He can change his looks that they have the shapeshifter Loki turn himself into a, a, a mare, a female horse, and he, he sort of teases 
the horse, the stallion that's doing all this work to chase him away so that he doesn't end up winning the big bat. Well, let's just say that Loki wasn't as fast as that stallion. <laughs> and when the stallion caught Loki, who was in the shape of a female horse, the result was Schleipnir, the eight-legged horse that Odin rides. Okay, so strange happenings back in those days. Um, but this gives you a little bit of an idea. And then over here you have Freya, Freyr, Njord, and Skadi. Njord and Skadi are two of the Vanir deities, and it's, they are the ultimate star-crossed lovers because Njord is the god of the seas, the Vanir god of the seas, and he loves the sea, and he can't stand to leave the sea. Well, he's in love with Skadi, who's in love with him, but Skadi is the goddess of skiing. Remember, these are Norse. And she loves the mountains, and she can't stand to leave the mountains. So he won't leave the sea, and she won't leave the mountains, and so they're the ultimate star-crossed lovers because they cannot be together because of what they love. I mentioned the extent to which J.R.R. Tolkien is dependent upon all of these stories. And in fact, when Tolkien was a professor uh, at Cambridge, he started a, a Nordic mythology group to, to be a member of this group, which considered a great honor, C.S. Lewis learned to speak Icelandic and read Icelandic because you had to read them in the original languages. And so there were a number of scholars like C.S. Lewis and others who learned to read Icelandic just so they could be part of this group studying the great mythologies, all right? So let's talk about some of the gods. This is Odin, the Allfather, who astonishingly looks just like Sir Anthony Hopkins. Um, I'm used, I use some images from the Marvel movies here, so you might be able to relate to that. Um, you will notice that he has one eye. He gave up one of his eyes in the pursuit of wisdom. In order to have wisdom, he gave up one of his eyes. In fact, Odin, as the Allfather, is the god of, um, the, of wisdom, of knowledge, of war, but he is always searching for knowledge. He is the one, he's the main god of all of the Norse gods, and uh, he, in exchange for wisdom, he does all sorts of things. He loses an eye. In order to gain an understanding of the runic alphabet, of the runic language, you know, the runes are the language of the ancient Norse, he hanged himself on a tree for nine days and nine nights, actually on the tree of Yggdrasil, and in return for that, he was given knowledge of runic writing, and he turns around and gives the runes to humans. So that's where the Norse people said they got their ability to write. He is always pictured with two ravens. You'll notice here, these are two different images of that. But with two ravens, those ravens are called Hugin and Munin. They represent thought and memory. And um, Odin was famous for saying that if he had to lose one of them, he would rather lose his thought than to lose his memory because his wisdom came from his memory. He also has two wolves. Whether they're black wolves or white wolves, he always has two wolves along with two ra uh, ravens. And he pursues knowledge and willing to sacrifice for the sake of others. He is the ruler over all of the Aesir, but he has his own hall called Velasdaf. It's hard to pronounce these words. And he also has a second hall, which is called Valhalla. Valhalla is where the honorable dead, those who die in battle with their weapon in their hands, that they get to go, and every day they can fight and feast and womanize and drink. And if they get killed in a fight, and the idea is that all of your enemies that you killed are going to be waiting for you and welcoming you so that you can fight again. And if you die, you get reborn and you start it all over again. As I've said before, I don't remember if it was you or the last time I did this talk. I knew some guys in college just like that. Every, every <laughs> night they would, you know, they drink and womanize, and every night it was like they died, and then tomorrow they'd start all over again. I never did quite understand all of that. Um, Odin's wife is Frigg, and you'll notice here, this is um, Frigg and Odin and the two ravens. So that's how, usually those symbols are how you know that we're talking about Odin here. I'll have either the ravens or the wolves or both. Frigg is the goddess of marriage and motherhood, of love and fertility, and we believe, I'll talk about it in a minute, she may be, uh, the origin of Frigg may be the same as the origin of the goddess Freya, but Frigg sees the future, but she will not tell anyone what she sees. She will not even tell her husband Odin. 
Odin and Frigg have a son named Baldr, who is the most beautiful of all of the gods, and also a blind son named Hodor. And Hodor ends up inadvertently killing Baldr. More on that later. Freya is one of the Vanir, one of the other gods, and this is Emily Blunt playing um, Freya. She, Freya literally means um, the lady in Norse. She is the goddess of, of sex and beauty, fertility, of gold, but also of magic. She, her chariot is drawn by two cats. You can see the cats down here. They're, they're fearsome sort of uh, white cats here. Here they look more like tabbies. Every, some of the images I've seen of it, they look more like terriers, but they're supposed to be cats. And they pull her, um, her chariot. She has a cloak made of falcon feathers, which is magical, and she will loan it out to other gods in order to help them accomplish things. Um, she, as I say, she was responsible, they tried to kill her. She was responsible for the war between the Aesir and the, the Vanir, but she's, she's one that uh, everyone desires. She is the desirable one. Um, she has, her hall, or her field actually, is called Folkvanger, and I mentioned that when people die uh, with weapon in their hand, they get to go to Valhalla. Well, the agreement with, with uh, Freya later on was that she gets to pick half of them to come and live in her field, Volkvanger. Um, and so she gets to claim, she always arrives at the scene of battle, and she gets to claim half of the dead. We believe that she may have been, uh, as I say, the same as, as Frigg. There may have been a development of these two goddesses one an Aesir goddess and one of a Vanir goddess from the same source because they have a lot of the same um, characteristics. Not only that, but whereas Frigg is married to Odin, Freya is married to Odur, and so which is very much the same. Her father is Njord, and her brother is Frey, which means the Lord. But Nord is the one who is in love. The Nord is the god of ships and seafaring in the sea, and he's in love with Skadi, who is the skiing and hunting goddess. Then we have, you know, he looks like all of the waiters that we saw when we were in Copenhagen. Um, we have Thor, the god of thunder, and he's one of the most popular gods. He always has been, partly because one of his responsibilities is to protect human beings. He is responsible for maintaining justice in Asgard, but also for protecting the residents of Midgard. He is uh, obviously known as the Thunder God. He's also the God of fertility, the God of, um, of sanctification. Whenever they want to make a place holy, they will call on Thor to sanctify it. He carries the great hammer, Mjolnir, which is he uses primarily against giants, but against any who would do violence. Um, he, too, has a chariot. His chariot is pulled by goats. I would have thought stallions or something, but no, it's goats. And the goats' names, translated, mean tooth grinder and tooth gritter. And they're magical because if he gets hungry, he can kill them and eat them. And as long as he collects up their skin and their bones, they will be reconstituted tomorrow. And there's a story about a, a farmer that um, Thor goat comes to the man's land and he's hungry and he agrees to let the guy eat with him. And so he kills and cooks his two goats. Well, without Thor knowing it, that night, the farmer gets up and goes and starts breaking open the bones of, of the, one of the goats to suck the marrow out of the bones. And the next day, when tooth grinder and tooth gritter are resurrected, reconstituted, I'm not exactly sure what that word would be, um, one of them is limping badly. And Thor gets so angry when he finds out that this farmer had damaged the bones that the farmer, has, the farmer says, oh, don't hurt me, you can take my two children. So they become Thor's servants from then on. All kinds of stories. He's associated with healing, with oak trees. He has not only Mjolnir, the famous hammer, but he also has a magical belt, iron gloves that are magical, and a staff that are magical. He is one of, as I said, the most popular gods, especially during the time when Christianization was happening. Thor, because he's seen as the one that protects human beings, he's the one that so many of the followers of Norse religion looked to to try to um, you know, rely on to fight back against the coming of Christianity. And the Thor's hammers, if you're in Norway, or especially if you go to Iceland, one of the most popular sort of souvenirs are these little Thor, uh, very, some of them are beautiful in terms of the way they're carved, hammers that represent Thor, whereas Christians would wear crosses during the time when Christianity was coming to the Northlands, 
Um, the they would wear Christians would wear crosses, and the Norse believers would wear uh, Thor's hammer uh, as a sign of their belief in that. Now, um, later on, well, I'll talk about that when we get to Ragnarok. There is a uh, there's a huge veneration of Thor going on now in the resurrected neo paganism. The uh, particularly the neo Norse paganism. There's also a neo German paganism and a neo Druid paganism. There's this the human desire to find some meaning in things, um, that there, there's a real, uh, a real rebirth of Thor as a focal point. We have Loki, who again in the movies, this is Tom uh, Hiddleston in the movies, great character. Um, Loki is presented as a god in the movies, but he's actually, uh, and, and Thor's half-brother, but he actually is a, a god, he is the trickster, he's called the sly one, he's a shape changer, he's called the sky traveler. Um, he, after causing the death of Baldur the Beautiful, he ends up being bound along with one of his children, Fenrir Wolf, they're both bound and they break free and they're the cause of the coming of the end of the world or Ragnarok. Baldur the Beautiful, I don't think he's been represented in any of the Marvel movies yet, but um, he is the son of Odin and Frigg. He is the gentlest and wisest, the best of the gods. He is the, uh, the absolute essence of friendliness and eloquence, light, joy, purity, innocence, reconciliation. And his brother, Hoder, who is blind, um, accidentally kills him. Well, it's an accident on Hoder's part. It's not on Loki's part. Um, Frigg, his mother, Baldur's mother, has a dream that uh, of, of Baldur's death, and so she goes to Earth and makes everything promise that they will not harm Baldur. And she gets every animal, every person, every plant to swear they will not harm Baldur to try to protect it because she's had this vision. And all of them agree except for the mistletoe plant. And then they, when the time comes, Loki convinces Hoder to throw a dart made out of a mistletoe plant. Hoder can't even see where he's throwing it. And he ends up killing his brother Balder. And because Balder died without a weapon in his hand, he is sent to Helheim, to the place of disreputable death. And they try to get him back and everything else, but he doesn't get to return until after the end of the world, after Ragnarok. And so Balder the Beautiful represents light. In fact, he's said to be the source of light in the world. You get uh, Heimdall, who is one of my favorite characters. Heimdall the Watcher. He is the guardian. Heimdall is responsible for guarding the bridge between Midgard and Asgard, between Middle Earth, where humans live, and the place of the gods. The bridge is the Rainbow Bridge. It looks like Bifrost, and it's pronounced Bifrost in the movies because I think they're afraid people will laugh if they pronounce it the way it's supposed to be pronounced, which is beef roast. B-I-F-R-O-S-T, <laughs> beef roast. It is the rainbow bridge by which the gods can go back and forth to Midgard, and he is the one, he has this great horn, which is called Jal, and Jal is the horn he is to sound whenever he sees enemies coming and he does sound it at the last during the time of Ragnarok to let the let the gods in Asgard know that the giants are coming and that there is danger ahead. Um, he is the watcher. It's He has gold teeth. He can hear the grass growing. He can see things happening everywhere in all of the nine worlds, which is why he is the watcher, the guardian over the Bifrost. Um, and the Bifrost, the rainbow bridge, is represented by the rainbow and the nature of the ephemeral rainbow of the sort of, sh the word actually means sort of shimmering rainbow. The fact that any time a rainbow appears, it's supposed to represent to those who believe in North mythology, the reality of the gods and of the gods' ability to travel. One more god I want to tell you about is Hell. Hell is one of the children, and you can see down here, Fenrir Wolf, German Gander, the Great Serpent, and Hell are all children, along with Schleipnir, the Eight-Legged Horse, of Loki. Hell is represented usually as being half beautiful woman and half skeletal symbol of death. In the original writing, her face and upper torso was alive, and then her stomach and legs were dead. But there's no fun in representing that. 
So they usually represent her something like this. You see her sitting in judgment. This is when an appeal is being made to her to release the spirit of Baldur, who didn't deserve to be there. Um, and then you often see her on a throne because she rules over the realm of the dead. Um, not a very pleasant picture. Now, I told you about the beginning of the world according to Norse mythology. The end of the world in Norse mythology is called Ragnarok. And there are subtle translation differences. Uh, it can either mean the twilight of the gods, which is how they used it in uh, Wagner's operas, or the doom of the gods. What happens here is there had been long-time prophecies of the coming of the end of the world, and the, the gods of the Aesir knew about this, and they knew there were prophecies. Well, the first of the prophecy that, that told them it was about to happen was when Baldur was killed by his blind brother Hodor. That was the fulfillment of the first property, at prop, prophecy. At that point, they knew the end was near, but still they determined to fight back against it. And so Odin recruited the very best human warriors he could to try to fight back against the forces of evil, because since the first since the creation, when Odin and his two brothers killed Emir and all, almost all the other giants, there were a few that survived, the giants had been trying to pull creation back to chaos. And so it's an issue, remember? Order comes from chaos. Well, chaos has always been trying to take it back, and the giants are, is the, are the representative of chaos. And so they want to pull back into chaos. And so Odin recruits human warriors to try to fight the giants in the great battle at the end. In Midgard, the place where humans live, human civilization begins to lose their traditional ways. They abandon their bonds of kinship and of faithfulness, uh, loyalty. They become sort of nihilistic, not believing in anything anymore. Sound familiar? Hmm. And so that's all part of the prophecy of what's coming in Ragnarok. Then three winters happen in a row. It's called the Thimble Winter, the long winter, without any summer in between. The, at that point, the pseudo-god, the giant who pretends to be a god, Loki, and one of his children, Fenrir Wolf, break free from the chains they were bound in. They gather up the giants, they create a great army, they start charging across the Beef Roast Bridge, the Rainbow Bridge, Heimdall seeds them, sounds the horn, and the gods come out and begin to do battle with them, and yet the giants are winning. Now in most cases, when there's a one-on-one -on -one battle, um, it's both parties get killed in this story. Fenrir, the great wolf, does succeed in killing Odin, the Allfather. But then Odin's son is successful, Vidar is his name, is successful in then killing Fenrir wolf. But uh, Thor and the great serpent Jormungandr kill each other. Thor is bitten as he's killing Jormungandr and he staggers nine steps and then falls dead. Surt, the, the fire god, and Freyr, the god, kill each other. Heimdall, the guardian, and Loki kill each other. Um, Tyr, also, along with Odin, is killed by Fenrir Wolf, so all of the gods are being killed. Ultimately, the whole process of creation is reversed. The world falls into darkness and then sinks into the abyss. But remember, the idea of everything being cyclical is fundamental to Norse mythology, and so after a time, the earth is risen again. Baldur returns from the underworld as the best of all the gods. Eventually, all of the gods are reborn, and a new human pair named Lif and Lifrasir are created to start the human race again. And we begin it all over again in a green world, and there is much merrymaking. Now, <laughs> there is. There is, uh, some people have tried to draw a comparison between this and the Christian idea of the end times. But again, this is all cyclical, whereas that's not the Christian theology, where there will be an end to history as we know it, and there will be, you know, there will be heaven, but it will be a very different kind of situation. This recycles to be very much the same sort of thing, and the idea is that will exist for a while, and then that will lead to destruction, to chaos. And out of chaos will come order, and eventually will come chaos, and out of that will come order. And so it's very much a cycle. So this is a 45-minute lesson in thousands of years of Norse mythology. Any questions about any of that? Oh my gosh. I sometimes get that, that reaction. Oh my gosh. Yes? What happened to Odin's brother? What happened to Odin's brothers? Vili and V. 
I don't even know. I'd have to go back and research that. They don't show up a whole lot after that. Odin was the oldest and the, the most powerful, and he is the one, you know, Billy and V are involved with him in killing Emir, and then after that, the only thing in my reading that you hear about is Odin. I'm sure there's, there's some reference somewhere, but I'm not aware of what it is. There, there are tens of thousands of pages of this stuff, you know, so, and, and they're not, they don't come up in the later mythologies that I'm aware of, and so I don't know. Yes? Uh, Neil Gaiman recently wrote a book called Birth Mythology. Right. Which, you want to comment on that? Well, somebody just gave me that book. I have not read it. But Neil Gaiman is very much part of the whole Marvel world. You know, he's connected in that, and he's written some of the, some of the, the things they've done. And so he did the service, and I, I have the book in my cabin, and I, I look forward to reading it, because somebody gave it to me the last time I gave this lecture on Star Pride. And he has gone back and written, in sort of a novel form, the Norse mythologies. And it's called, you know, uh, Norse mythology. And so I'm looking forward to reading it, because Gaiman's great. He's an excellent writer. So have you read it? Yeah. What'd you think? Uh, lots of similarities, lots of identical Right. Yeah, I think he really is trying to, in, in a contemporary language, he's trying to write these stories. So he's not like he's, unlike the Marvel movies, he, he, in this book, he doesn't take the stories and then try to create a, you know, a new, he doesn't try to reimagine it in some way. He actually is trying to record what the old stories were. Yes? So if you describe the, the theory that uh, mythology is supposed to uh, represent something that's not there, and you're saying that the Right. So the question is, uh, does because mythology is seen as into helping people integrate into their society, does the knowledge about the way the Vikings particularly lived is that reinforced by this? Is this an integral part of that? I think absolutely. The whole you know the whole martial idea. Most of the great gods were warriors. Odin, Thor, etc. They they. The good guys were almost always warriors. They all they represented, and that's sort of what the neo-paganist idea, Norse, Norse neo-paganism, is about regaining honor and strength and pride. And you know, although they're real quick to say, but we're not going to do any human sacrifice or even animal sacrifice, and we're not going to take slaves, which was very common back then. You know, they try to they try to caution that. But I think that's true, and it's also true. Human beings have always try to uh, understand themselves and how everything came to be. I mean, we, we, want, we want to be able to pin it down. We want to be able to say, this is why it's like this. And every mythology um, and the many different versions of religion, you know, we all have to decide which one we believe is right. You know, I'm a Christian minister, so I, I've decided. But I feel a responsibility as well. I teach classes on, on, uh, on uh, comparative religion because I believe I can only I can only say firmly that this is what I believe if I am fair in understanding what other people believe. And I think the same thing is true in mythology, that the mythologies were efforts to try to understand where did the world come from? You know, why in, in the ancient times, um, and they'll draw a difference between a, a revealed religion and perceived religion. The monotheistic religions say that their understanding of truth was given to them by God, that God initiated it. The perceived religions in ancient times, they would hear thunder. Um, and the loudest noise that anybody heard before electrical amplification was thunder. And they would see lightning, and they would see it in the mountains, and the next thing they know, there's this huge flood coming down the river. And they would, they would try to figure that out. What is causing this? Because that's the first step in having feeling like you have some control over things, is to understanding what the cause is. And so they, would, they developed a, a belief in the god of thunder, and that the gods were at war, and that the god of the river was angry at the God, you know, et cetera. And so all of this was an attempt to try to understand the environment that they could perceive. So by first understanding it, you they then hopefully would then be able to control it by propitiating the gods, you know, by, by trying to honor them in some way. Um, and that's where a lot of the, uh, of particularly animistic religions and things come from, as well as some mythologies. That's way deep, but, you know, yes. What happens when a woman dies? They don't really talk about that. I think I think there was a suggestion that Freya might take care of them. Um, you know that she was the goddess of beauty and and all of that. That in addition to getting half of the honorable warriors, that she would be the one to take care of women as well. But you know it was a you know 
a journalistic society. They, they didn't focus a whole lot on what was going to happen to the women. It was the men, right? Yes? I was just going to say that if the men who died honorable death went to a place where they could fight and womanize, the women had to come from. Where did the women come from? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it had to come from somewhere, probably slaves, right? But there are, in fact, when we talk about women, in Norse mythology at least, the women are really strong characters. I mean, Freya is very powerful. She's a goddess of not only magic and beauty and, and, and fertility and all that, but she's also a goddess of war. And there's a weird kind of mix. But the, the, the goddesses in Norse mythology are as fully rounded out in their characteristics as the men gods are. Um, and they have to get credit for that. I mean, uh, Hel is she controls a whole realm, you know, and that's hers. And so the, the goddesses are given a lot of respect, and I think that that was consistent with the, the uh, Norse lifestyle. Women were respected, you know, women had a voice. They could speak out. They didn't go to war, they didn't go to battle, and I, I simply don't know the, the theology or the mythology of where the women would end up. But yes, we do have examples of the, the Valkyrie. Um, you know, the Valkyrie were part of the Wagnerian operas, and the Valkyrie were the ones that at the behest of Odin would go down, and they're sort of like angelic figures almost, to give you a little bit of a parallel, although that breaks down. They would come in and they would take the souls of the, the men who died honorably in battle and take them back to Valhalla. So the Valkyries were sort of the, the, the angelic messengers who would take the souls back to, to the positive place, and they were female. Okay, so um, yeah, you do have characters like that, but it's it's it, they don't full, full, the goddesses they have are fully developed, but they don't give a whole lot whole lot of information about what's happened what happens to human women. Okay, one more question. So Valhalla is really just the hall of Odin in Asgard. Right, that's correct. Yeah, and the hall, but again, you have to know that for the Vikings, the hall was everything. The hall was where you lived. You slept there. You gathered there. Uh, people would have often have their own houses, but most of the activity uh, would happen in the halls. The halls would often have elevated benches that people would sleep on. It's where you had all the communal meetings. It's where you had your meals. Um, there was always a fire there so that you were warmed by it. And so the hall was the whole thing. And so when you say you're going to a hall, it's like the best combination ever of a hunting lodge and a pub that you can, you know, you could experience. It's the uh, C.S. Um, G.K. Chesterton talked about the end, the end at the end of the world. Well, that's sort of a Christian view of, uh, of Valhalla. Thank you all. Oh, yes, one more. Well, the, um, they're not horns in the same way. They're not cow horns. These are, these are a kind of helmet that is, you know, like that. Um, it's, I don't know. <laughs> I know the Vikings did not wear horns on their helmet, and probably simply because it wasn't practical. If you're fighting, you know, the way the Vikings fought were in shield walls. They would, you know, they would, you would, you would hold your shield next to the other guy, and you would push at the other shield wall and try to gain an advantage the whole time you're trying to stab them underneath or hit them with an axe over the top. Well, you're pulling and grabbing and, you know, grabbing them for their, for their uh, uh, jackets or mail and to try to pull them over the line to kill them. Imagine having these things sticking up. It's like, okay, grab me here, you know. Um, it wasn't practical, uh, but we do have the mythology. Now, a lot of these are, are um, wings because they, the, but you do get Loki. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's uh, we do have those examples from, but again, even these are not. It's not like they're photographs of the gods. Somebody, somebody came up with this. They drew this stuff, and then. For the same reason that, that like when we were in uh, Copenhagen, there was this, a dairy truck goes by. And this dairy has as their symbol a Viking with horns on his helmet. And I'm going, mm. even in Scandinavia, in Iceland, the same thing. It's because if you want them to know that this is a Viking or a Norse god, you almost have to put horns on their helmet. And so that would have been true for the drawings that a lot of stuff was based on too. Okay. Thank you all very much.